Ah, so welcome to Hollyoak House. Uh, welcome to the 2018 Annual General Meeting of Cooperatives UK. Uh, it's, it's absolutely delightful to be in a room which is standing room only. Maybe we should have thought about getting a smaller room earlier. <laughs> uh, it's slightly daunting, however, so usually when you're on a stage and you're dressing the huddle masses, you can't see the lights of their eyes. And now, unfortunately, I can see everybody. And so my self-consciousness has gone through the roof. So can I, uh, as chair of Cooperatives UK, my name is Nick Matthews. I'm from the Heart of England Cooperative Society. I'd like to warmly welcome you both to Hollyoak House and to the Pauline Green Room in Hollyoak House. It's very unusual for cooperators to name a room over somebody before they're dead. <laughs> <laughs> but we thought that Pauline had been such an auspicious cooperator to have a woman cooperator from Britain as the general secretary of the International Cooperative Alliance, we think was a very significant event and worthy of the commemoration of this particular room. Now, I know a couple of years ago at the AGM of the, uh, uh, our, our largest member of the co-op, there was an altercation over the warnings and announcements uh, before the meeting started. So I'll tell you, we're not expecting a fire alarm, but if there is one, we leave the way we came in, do not use the lift, uh, use the stairs. We go out, we turn right, and we assemble in what is now Sadler's Yard. Uh, secondly, if you need to use the facilities, uh, I think when you get to the stairwell, you see the ladies is, is down and the men's is up. That's always the case, I'm afraid. Men always leave things up. Uh, but for those at home, I think they'll know where their toilets are, hopefully, if they're on the internet. They'll know where their toilets are in their own home. And if they don't, uh, get off the internet and uh, find out. So without any more uh, piffle from me, my name is Nick Matthews. On my right is the secretary of the society, uh, Zena King. I just forgot your name then, Zena. Brilliant. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good start, isn't it? Uh, Zena King. Zena, uh, this is our first annual general meeting. You'll have seen Zena running around like a beaver at previous annual general meetings, making sure that everything worked well. And uh, now she has responsibility for being on the top table, so I hope you'll, you'll be kind to Zena. And on my left uh, is Ed Mayo, not politically, of course, is Ed Mayo. Uh, the, general, uh, uh, the Secretary General of a, a, a great organisation. Uh, so that's that's the top table. Just uh, just a, a, another little bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, voting members will have one of these. Uh, you should have given in your attendance card when you arrived. If you haven't, give it to John to make sure that your attendance is recorded. Uh, there's a process at home again, which you'll remind me of, yeah. uh, so that we know people have logged in and have got the appropriate voting uh, materials. Uh, when there's a vote, uh, uh, just hold your card up. If uh, if there needs to be a card vote, then we'll there are we'll have a proper we'll go through a process of of uh, of, of doing that. Uh, most of the votes, I hope, will be by a show of hands. I don't think there's anything exciting or contentious uh, mm -hmm. on the agenda. Uh, but you never know. Let's hope we have an argument about something, otherwise it'll be a waste of a Friday night after a few glasses of wine. Uh, so before I... Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll be taking the notice of the meeting as read. Uh, if anybody requires uh, paper versions uh, on the way in, uh, any of the papers, uh, paper copies of the formal papers of the meeting are available on the table in the refreshments room before you went in. All the other material, of course, was published uh, electronically. So, uh, right, before we go to any of the decisions today, uh, it's almost a year since we launched the National Corporate Development Strategy, a strategy focused on a different kind of economy, uh, one powered by cooperation, which challenges people to work together to harness the growing desire for a fairer economy. I don't think that's, uh, you know, that's going to be an exciting concept to the people in the room, but it ought to be an exciting con con concept out there. Part of that strategy was the idea that we, we do it ourselves, and obviously as, a, as an umbrella body, we have the responsibility to carry out some of that role ourselves. Uh, we're going to start this meeting by hearing some important messages from colleagues and, and members of our organisation have, uh, have, have just, been, just been doing just that. So let me... Uh, let me uh, introduce you to the, the three participants who are going to set the scene for us this evening. Uh, Jane Powell from Lincoln Cooperative Society, uh, Steve Hurry from Leeds Community Homes, and then Liam McLeod from Media Blaze. Without me 
uh, blotting my copybook any further, perhaps uh, Jane, you would like to share your story with us. Uh, oh, good evening, everyone. And this is amazing. I don't think I've ever been in such a packed room. And thank you for that lovely introduction, Nick. Right, I've worked with Co-ops UK for longer than I care to admit. And at the time when I think I first worked with the organisation, it was in fact the old Co-op Union, as we saw on the introductory video. Um, and in that time, I've experienced the unique blend of support, advice and assistance that uh, the organisation can offer uh, in over the whole range of your purpose, promoting, uniting and developing Co-ops. So I've been asked to talk about the way that we've worked with Co-ops UK recently and in uh, the past. So I thought I'd talk about two strands of uh, your wonderful advice service. So there are two strands now, the, the um, excellent cooperative HR services, used to be known as the CEA to some of us in previous history. And they provide a fantastic service working with our HR teams, helping them uh, advise colleagues and employees on HR issues of all sorts of things, all sorts of varieties. They also help my board. And you can see a little extract from our remuneration report on the top. I picked a few examples in this talk, and it was really hard to just distill them into a small number of things because there is a, such a lot that Co-ops UK does. Um, but one of the things they do is help our board when it comes to its remuneration policy and its approach to remuneration uh, uh, in general through the CEA, providing advice to the board of directors on that. And we've got the little extract from the annual report up there. Um, but I've also used the wonderful rule change service numerous times. And you can see the rule changes that we did in 2015, which were about introducing young members. And then we're currently working on some new rules which we're putting to our members on the 9th of June about introducing a competency framework for our board. And the advice team at Co-ops UK have really helped us with that in, in, in a, a whole breadth of ways. And I'll talk about some of that in a bit more detail in a minute. But what they do is help us with the rule drafting, they help us with what we're gonna put in it, and then they register it with the SCA. And that's all part of our member advice service. We don't have to pay any more for that, which is absolutely wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Um, they also provide thought leadership on corporate governance in the co-op sector and we've been working on that with some of my colleagues earlier today and I've put up some of the examples of that on the slide which I isn't there that will be hopefully yep so uh, we've got the code the corporate governance consumer code which is drawn up by cooperatives UK last last revised in 2013 and we're looking at how that might look for the future um, there's the expert reference panel that I'm a member of, which is providing some guidance and resources about co uh, cooperative governance for, across the whole sector. And then uh, recently we've used that expertise, that real, really good expertise on our thought leadership on corporate governance to provide some paid for consultancy for my board, uh, working with face to face development sessions for our board of directors, delving deeply and conscientiously into the role and responsibilities of corporate directors, focusing on those gritty issues that we all have to look at on a day to day basis, especially the inherent conflict the election process brings to selection for our boards. Um, and that's where Co-ops UK sound guidance helped the most. And working with them together, the board developed a competency framework, um, which you can see there's a little sort of diagrammatical rep representation of it there, but it was a competency framework that our directors chose. And we will be putting that to the members to vote on whether or not we can use that in the future uh, at our meetings in June. So I couldn't give a talk like this without mentioning the myriad of other things that Co-ops UK does. And as you know, they run a whole load of training events and you can access all of that information on the website. Uh, there's a picture of me and some of my directors at the Co-op Retail Conference and they're embarrassed, I think. Um, and uh, I, I can't move on from this bit without mentioning the Practitioners Forum in November, which is a wonderful event that is, well, it's always sold out, isn't it, every year. So great networking opportunity. Um, there, we've also, you've mentioned this in your talk, 
Um, that's Dame Pauline launching the National Co-op Development Strategy. And we hope at Lincolnshire Co-op that we'll be able to work with Co-ops UK in the future, looking at how you can connect the national framework for co-op development with local delivery on the ground. And uh, these are some examples of local co-ops that I really love. That we've got in the, these are ones from our trading area in Lincolnshire and on the top oh slightly moved a bit but um at the top in the middle you've got Lark Rise and that's a co-op in just outside Lincoln uh where of co-op of of care providers for people with learning disabilities and the co the members of the co-op are the care providers themselves and the service users and they provide a daycare service for um uh, for those adults with learning disabilities, they identified that there was a gap in the market where, where kids were leaving school, there wasn't anything for them to do, and they created this, they're, they're wonderful. Um, at top right, you've got Grimsby Community Energy, which has also been supported by Co-op Group for the Hive project, and uh, Lincolnshire Co-ops invested £5,000 in community shares in them. Uh, bottom, sort of to the left, that's Chainbridge Forge, that's a working Forge Museum that's a cooperative that's based on the east coast of Lincolnshire and bottom right is the um, University of Lincoln School of Social Sciences which is setting up a unique blend of co-op learning where the, the learners work jointly with the lecturers to develop the courses. Um, all right, and, and this is uh, uh, just a little illustration of the international work that COPS UK does in combining, working with all of us, bringing together to combine um, resources when there's an, an international incident. So these are about four fundraising initiatives. Uh, one example is the um, yeah Japanese earthquake. We donated ten thousand pounds for that, and five thousand pounds to Typhoon Fund. Um, promoting co-ops locally. This would be the big co-op clean. And you can see some of our members and colleagues cleaning things up as part of that annual initiative. I really like the way that Co-ops UK promotes co-ops in a whole load of different things. And this was an example of one initiative um, where we worked with Co-ops UK looking at what is the impact of Lincolnshire co-op on the local economy? What happens? And we found that for every £100 that's goes money that goes through our tills an additional 40 pounds is generated for local suppliers customers and employees that was quite a good piece of research wasn't it um and okay so i couldn't finish without mentioning the fantastic resources that are on the website so just a couple of things that these are resources that are on the website that anybody can use that i've picked out that we've used ourselves in our organization so it's guidance on gdpr guidance on modern slavery so thank you so much for listening. I really hope this uh, was what you wanted me to talk about, but it's given, uh, <laughs> um, but it has given uh, really an overview of the breadth of things that Co-ops UK does for its members. Um, and I'd also like to finish by thanking Ed, Nick and Zena for their wise counsel and support over the years. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's good to be here. I'm Steve Hurry. I've come across from Leeds. I work at Leeds Community Homes. I'm going to tell you uh, all about what we've been up to. Um, we're members. I've got my little voting card there, so I'll be staying around. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about cooperating to create people-powered homes. Um, so to start off with, this slide kind of makes us remember that there's a long history uh, around cooperating. And particularly, we're interested in housing. That's why I've got the slide with the, the house there. But um, Homo sapiens has been around for about 200,000 years. And um, Homo erectus, they reckon, maybe 2 million years. So, um, and we've been creating shelter, and most of that time we were wandering around in small bands, helping each other out, looking after each other, building houses and other shelters. So this is just not a new thing, really, cooperation in general, and also housing, doing housing together. Um, some of 
some other ways of doing housing are really very recent blips in history. Um, so really what we're, part of what we're trying to do maybe is get back towards let's do this co cooperatively, let's do uh, affordable housing. Um, our houses will hopefully be a bit more energy efficient than, than that one, um, but you never know. Um, so so in a, just very briefly, um, Leeds Community Home started four years ago um, when Paul Chatterton, who is one of the co-founders at Lilac, which is also a co-op, and myself got together over a coffee and just said, look, there's loads of great community-led housing happening in Leeds. How do we make more of that happen? And we quickly gathered a group of people around us, including Rob Greenland, Jill Coupland, um, people from Latch, Canopy, Gipsville, um, and other partners as well, including Leader, who are also a co-op um, doing architecture and engineering in Leeds. Um, and formed a small group and decided quite quickly to found a uh, community benefit society called Leeds Community Homes. And we deliberated for quite a while about what our first project might be. This is an artist's impression of uh, the development on the Climate Innovation District, just south of Leeds City Centre near the Royal Armouries, spanning the river. And this is the site of our first project. Um, so we. Last winter, we launched a community share issue, which was really successful. We raised £360,000, which is our uh, top target, which is brilliant. We also attracted uh, 275 members to the co-op through that share issue as well, which gives us a really good uh, kind of boost and, uh, you know, good membership base um, on which to build. So with this project, that £360,000 through a deal with the private developers called Situ and Leeds City Council, um, we're going to be purchasing 16 uh, affordable homes on that site out of the 500 that they're going to be building. Um, and so that's going to be phenomenal. They're on site now. You can see the building starting to go up, which is great. Um, the other thing that we're up to is that in December, Power to Change decided to give us a grant to help us develop our Enabler Hub service. And through that service, we're going to be um, working with a, a small number of groups, four in the first six months, um, but also a, a wider range of groups, less intensively. And we're in touch with about 20 different groups, local authorities, co-ops, um, community-led housing groups. Uh, individuals who want to do housing and what we're hopefully going to be doing is uh, advising them, supporting them in Leeds and the wider region. We've had interest from Kirklees Council as well, um, Bradford City Council, uh, people over there are interested, Harrogate um, and Wakefield. So it's kind of spreading a bit and uh, as the only member of staff I'm getting a bit stretched actually but we're really keen to be in touch with everyone who's interested in community-led housing um, and really see how much we can enable. So um, I'm coming up to my five minutes, so that's quite handy. Just to sum up, um, it's been a great four years. This last few months has been um, a real whirlwind as we've had a little bit of funding. So the directors who have been brilliant over the last uh, three, four years have been putting in loads of their time. And now we've actually got someone, me, who can um, kind of get things done in the office a bit more and get out and meet people. And so hopefully, um, you know, thanks to, to the support of Co-ops UK, which has been really valuable over those years. Um, and hopefully in maybe three or four or five years time, you'll be hearing about all the houses we've built. We've got quite an ambitious target of uh, building or enabling a thousand homes over 10 years. So we'll see how that goes. Thanks very much. Liam, the floor's yours. Apologies. Dare apologise. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, my name's Liam. Liam Cloud, um, as Nick said. Uh, thank you for having me. It's awesome. Uh, I just wanted to talk a bit about uh, basically uh, the business that uh, we run. Uh, it's an IT business, we're dealing mainly web hosting, IT security, things like that. Um, but what we have been doing is we've been partnering up with other worker-based cooperatives uh, to bring 
together Cotech, which is a group of technology-based uh, worker co-ops ranging from various skill sets, uh, which enables us to kind of bid and work together for various projects. So currently within, within Cotech, uh, we have 32 members. Uh, between those 32 members, there's over 255 members of staff, uh, generated over 10.4 million pound worth of revenue and over 287 clients, including the Co-ops UK. So that is some of the work that we deal with. We have a range of clients, and again, those clients range quite broadly. Uh, say, see, BBC. Uh, <laughs> Aston Villa. Apologies about that, but hey, what can you do? Uh, so yes, yeah, so obviously within the skill sets, it ranges from animation to IT, consultancy, mentoring, printing, hosting, web design, so just to name a few. So the range of technologies used within the group primi primarily are based on open source software uh, and applications that we can have an impact on and influence and we can help build um, amongst other, other work co-ops and other developers as well. So a lot of our participation is mainly based online. We use a online forum to discuss a lot of the work that we do. Uh, currently, it's been running for just over a year. Uh, we've got around 228 topics within there, um, 100, uh, sorry, 1.9 thousand posts, uh, 1.5 million, uh, sorry, 1.5 thousand daily engaged users and a steady stream um, of discussion. So within that, again, we talk different events, mainly about cooperatives, labor movement, technology, cryptocurrencies, governance and constitutions and we help to develop kind of handbooks for tech-based cooperatives to help them to help them identify to be cooperative as possible so there is a yearly meetup that we do have uh, and that's based at Wortley Hall as you can see a lovely place um, so that's that's every every year, maybe changing. However, for the past couple of years, it has been based at Wally Hall, and it just gives them an opportunity for everyone to kind of meet in person, discuss topics uh, such as obviously empowerment and engagement between members, um, and obviously the larger carp industry. Uh, we also use that time to help promote collaboration and work together in different um, teams to kind of build work that we can put together. So there'll be sessions that we can you know, try and maybe develop things and build a product as such. So again, here's an opportunity to meet face-to-face, -face, network, have fun mainly, and you know, identify the goals for the Cotech group. So within Cotech, Cotech and another work co-op, uh, Landish, helped to um, create this joint venture, it was called Space4, and it's a incubation hub, uh, co-working and event space based in Finsbury, Park in London. So it currently seats 24 desks with multiple members utilizing the space. So there's currently 16 members utilizing that, that space. So it was set up back in April 2016. And the idea was it was there to it was there to support new worker cooperatives coming into the industry um, and to you know help mentor them into becoming you know as best as they can. Uh, so with that, uh, there was a few difficulties in terms of you know building that, in terms of building the community, and in terms of financing those kind of issues. So, with Cooperative UK, it, the you know it's great that you can kind of go to them and get that advice in terms of where to go for financing things like that. Yeah. So just a bit about collaboration and cooperatives. We obviously and you know base host itself as well do believe in further cooperation between members and other cooperatives feel potentially there is a little lack of collaboration in in some respects um, identify those kind of barriers to collaboration find out what may be leaning people away from it and and again push for large cops to use smaller cooperatives because we are in the market and we are there and it can be difficult for us to get our foot in the door especially in the range of industries that there are um, and, and on the basis of that, I believe that is all I have to say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.
very fantastic uh, presentation. It gives you a flavour of the over 700 members we have in Cooperatives UK uh, from, from a, a society that's uh, about 150 year old who wanted two years old. Although the rate of growth of the two-year-olds is a bit scary, I think <laughs> uh, it looks like the, it looks like it's going to overtake some of our, uh, our older members very shortly if it carries on at that rate of growth, which is uh, very very exciting for all of us. So I'd like to thank those members for sharing their stories with you. I think that gives you a flavour of the interactions and the types of cooperatives uh, that we're working with now in Cooperatives UK. So again, thank you, thank all three of you for those uh, contributions. <clears throat> After now, move on to the first formal item of business. Uh, it's still an AGM after all. So firstly, we have to approve the minutes of the AGM on the 30th of June, 2017. Uh, looking around in the room, I know that some of you were actually there. Although it's a bit like the 60s, if you can remember, you know, if you were there, you won't be able to remember it. Uh, so can I have a, I'll propose those minutes as being a true and correct record. Will somebody second that from the floor for me? Thank you, Vincent. Um, Briar? Amber? I'll get in the, in your name, but I'll look. Uh, the resolution will be on the screen and online for the colleagues at home to uh, to absorb. So we'll have to wait a little bit while that goes up. Uh, for those voting in the room, uh, we need a show of cards just to support the resolution. Can we have that, please? Thank you very much. Again, a slight pause while we uh, we have the null points from Luxembourg in the in the on the online uh, vote. Uh, just before we do that, are anybody against the motion or any abstentions? Are there any abstentions? Or uh, if you don't vote at home, that will be an abstention. Uh, but if there's anybody at home who's against it, please say on there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that, so therefore, we move on to resolution number one from the agenda. Uh, this is the annual report and financial statements. Uh, the resolution is to receive the annual report and financial statements together with the report of the auditors for the year ending 31st of December 2017. Uh, I'm, I will formally move that resolution uh, to outline the financial statements. Can I welcome uh, Michael Shepard, the finance manager? Here we go. <coughs> I'm Michael Shepard, the finance manager for Corps UK. Welcome fellow cooperators in person and online to the annual general meeting of Corpses UK at Holyoke House. We're in the Pauline Green Room, which used to be mine and the finance office. I used to sit in that corner back in the day, and it proves our commitment to developing Holyoke House. It's my responsibility to present the financial statement outline report for the year ending December 2017, and it gives me great pleasure to do so. After my presentation and an update from our auditor, there will be time and an opportunity for questions. 2017 was the final year of our current three-year strategic plan, the outcomes against which the key performance indicators are logged on page 19 of the report. My presentation will concentrate on the finance performance from pages 20 to 43. We posted a pre-tax surplus of £2,427 before the power to change investment, which I will I'll cover in some detail shortly. Our cash flow statement shows that we have a reduction in our overall cash position of around £137,000, but it's still healthy at £1.4 Last time I'm going to talk about this, I promise. The Tsunami Donation Fund has been cleared and it's no longer in our account and it won't be mentioned again, especially by me. <laughs> and the report is available on the college website about its use. But it was it was valuable and it was good use, joking apart. There we go. In twenty seventeen we received four thousand seven hundred and seventy £477,000 from Power to Change, which is a charity, to invest in societies to kickstart their growth. This is our first year of this type of investment. We obtained financial and legal advice on the treatment of these funds. Corpses UK, UK will hold these shares and each year we will measure them for impairment. 
If monies are returned, we, look, we will look to reinvest them in other societies to continue the work. We will continue this work anyway under the Booster 2 programme and we will have further investment funds over the next few years. With these funds, Corpses UK acts as a conduit for money coming into the sector on a pilot basis. We cannot be sure that the investments will remain on our balance sheet or that the value will remain the same. It's an excellent initiative, but I wanted to touch to I wanted it's an excellent initiative and I wanted to make sure that our members are able to see our true underlying financial position this year and for subsequent years. So that's why it needs to be explained. If you think we've made thousands of pounds of profit as a member association, the simple answer is no, we haven't, unfortunately. Yep. Page 38 of the annual report shows the investments and these are the places that we invested and this That's, that's it, right, okay. <laughs> We're with it now. And these are the places in the country. So hopefully next year there'll be more yellow blobs. That's a technical term, I think. Really? <laughs> Income and expenditure has remained consistent and in line with expectations in previous years. We budgeted for a deficit in 2017 due to covering for and a lot, an employee's long-term sick absence and some repair works, but we ended up, up posting a small profit. As part of our strategy to diverse our income, the Retail Society's partnership subscription income as a percentage of our total income has reduced to 59% this year and it continues to be one of our KPI targets. Projects that meet the wide objectives of Corp UK are a large part of our work. We will continue to seek partnership funding for the work we do, and we have had success in securing funding for community initiatives that meet our mission of Promote, Develop, Unite. I'll get used to it by the time we finish. Expenditure. Personnel, as you would expect, is our biggest cost, and 49% of our expenditure is on core personnel, which was actually reduced by £27,000 year on year. Establishment costs are up by £6,000 year on year, but our income from lettings has increased by £28,000 with a nearly full occupancy of the building. Holy Alcal's letting has increased year on year by 8%, so we're in a good position. We continue to invest in the building and are proud that it remains the centre of excellence of the court movement. We, we can report that we've uh, retained the fair tax mark again and page 39, note 9, gives the detail on the tax position. I'm not going to go into that, you'll be pleased to know. The balance sheet. <laughs> Funding from projects is generally received in advance, with project income being held on the balance sheet as deferred income and recognised as the value of the work done and performed to date. So as per the accounts in the summary stated, this concludes my presentation to the AGM of the 2017 statutory accounts and rest assured my team and I will continue to look after the money. Finally, I'd like to thank my team and all the staff and board members for their work during 2017. Thank you for your patience and listening. I would now like to pass you to uh, Nicola Quayle, our auditor. Thank you, good evening. Um, the audit report for the year is set out on pages 24 and 25 of the annual report and financial statement. And I will just read the opinion paragraph. We've audited the financial statements of Cooperatives UK Limited for the year ended 31st of December 2017, which comprised the income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement, statements of changes in equity and related notes, including the accounting policies in note one. In our opinion, the financial statements give a true and fair view in accordance with UK accounting standards, including FRS 102, the financial reporting standard applicable in the UK and Republic of Ireland. 
of the state of, of the society's affairs as at 31st of December 2017 and of the income and expenditure of the society for the year then ended. And they comply with the requirements of the Cooperative and Community Benefit Societies Act 2014. Thank you. Thank you any, on, the, on, on the money, are there any questions to Michael or to the auditors? Just wait for the microphone, sorry. Thank you. Hi, Emma Howard, East of England Co-op. Um, I can see there's been a marked increase in expenditure for consultancy fees. I was just wondering um, if that's a one-off or if it's expected to be continued and if we could just have a little bit more information about that, because it certainly seems to be driving the profit figure. Thanks, Emma. Surplus, sorry. Included in the consultancy fees, we've actually got consultant. Very uh, funny. Yeah, we've got consultants that used to be members of staff. So the staff um, personnel has increased as the um, the consultancy has gone up. But it's to do with members of staff moving to consultancy, and it's a lot lower than the personnel that cost. Okay. Any other questions? That was that was interesting, wasn't it? The answer was, the answer was more complicated than the question. Uh, any other questions? Did everybody understand the power to change thing? No. no yes. <laughs> no. You know that we're, in, we're investing in startup co-ops and we take an equity share in the co-op and that's what the money is on our balance sheet. Sorry. You need a microphone, Jenny, sorry. I'm actually part of the regional co council as well, Cooperative East Midlands, and um, it would be quite good to learn perhaps as a vision of Co ops UK. If you are working in partnership with How to Change, how do you see that concept working across the whole cooperative movement to support regional um, bodies that are currently existing? As we all know, regional co councils are on the demise. Through funding cuts, um, what is the position that you could foresee going forward that you could be more supportive? Uh, thanks for that question. Yeah, it's not necessarily related to the finance. Can I ask to come back to the report back? Yeah, of uh, uh, More formally, is there any other questions on the on the accounts on the finances? No, that's excellent. Uh, Towards yours, Ed, so the rest of the annual report. Am I good to go? You are yeah. good to go. Good. It's a great pleasure to be here at the annual general meeting. Thank you very much uh, for travelling to be here or for logging in to, uh, to be here. Uh, excuse my lack of, of jacket. It's just hot enough uh, between us. Uh, in the uh, in the room and, and Jenny maybe I should just start with your question because uh, the power to change funding comes with very close ties which is that it's about a co-investment in uh, community benefit societies that are raising community share issues so Leeds Community Homes is a perfect example and and in some ways what was exciting about Leeds Community Homes and it's an amazing what's going on in the city is that actually every city should have a community homes uh, kind of project. This country cries out for housing. And actually, I think you are pioneering and piloting uh, kind of ways of, uh, of doing exactly, uh, exactly that. So the power to change funding is about equity capital co-investment, where local people are getting together to put up money. That's being matched uh, by that as a charitable funder. So it's not about regional structures or the valuable work uh, of regional kind of you know, bodies. Uh, Jane, thank you again for your uh, kind of input on that because it shows actually how much the larger consumer societies can do in their own trading area and, and, and that, that those regional connections are, are you know, core uh, to it uh, as, uh, as well. And I see that right across uh, our members. It's great privilege that I have to be able to go out and to visit uh, co-ops. I, you know, as if I go into Merthyr Tydfil, see there Merthyr Valley Homes, a significant housing multi-stakeholder cooperative, doing an extraordinary work to regenerate uh, a town that is tough. The football club has gone uh, cooperative as well. Uh, go to the uh, Channel Islands, where our vice chair is running a marathon uh, this weekend, but a 
uh, Werner again, the Channel Islands Cooperative Society doing something of the same. I must now be very brief because that was off script. Um, and I wanted to say that the work of Cooperatives UK is you'll be as members judges of what we do, but it's the coming together that makes us valuable, that we are a cooperative uh, of cooperatives. Now, we're not a young co-op. Um, there are one or two co-ops in the room that are a little bit older, but we are approaching in 2020 our 150th uh, anniversary. Um, I wasn't there at the start, but with thanks to Gillian, the Cooperative Heritage uh, kind of trust have been looking at the archives. And, and this is my um, predecessor, uh, Edward Van Sittart Neil, uh, who provided um, uh, advice and support as uh, General Secretary of the Cooperative Union in the late 19th century to a number of, uh, of, of kind of startup uh, co-ops and may well be co-ops in the room who benefited from that early example of cooperative uh, ad advice. And this rather lovely quote, 15 years into the founding of the Cooperative Union about the value of coming together. And today, these are tough times for sure, but they are also hopeful times for the cooperative sector. And what we do uh, is more relevant uh, than ever. Looking through in terms of our annual report and what we did over 2017, um, I thought I would pick out some key uh, numbers to share uh, kind of with you. And if there are any questions around any aspects of the annual report in our work, it would be a pleasure to talk uh, to it. This, the organization works to a strategy that is the same as the brass plaque on the side uh, of Holyoke House, this very special building, the home to the uh, cooperative uh, kind of movement. And in modern day parlance, the strategy set by the board is that we should promote, develop and unite cooperative uh, enterprises. The strategy that we're working to was set in 2014 when it was times of crisis and of stretch within the cooperative sector. And part of what we recognized was that we needed to uh, diversify our business base in line with our mission. And what Michael described in terms of our work on uh, finances and the work of the staff team is in and around how we do that. We provide member subscriptions. Uh, we use Holyoke House as a, um, as a base for co-ops, but we get a rental income uh, from that. And we attract money uh, for projects as well. Plus, we offer consultancy services. And if that wasn't clear in what Jane said, I think it was, uh, we are there to help if you would like us to do so. And we are three years into that strategy and the board has extended that same strategy through to 2020. I do want to thank uh, board members, many of whom present today, and in particular, Nick uh, as uh, chair for guiding us uh, through this period. So the numbers that um, I will work through uh, kind of very briefly, 97% um, uh, sat satisfaction with our uh, advisory uh, kind of services. Uh, and if you have not used our legal or governance advisory services, then uh, you'd be very welcome to be in contact. Um, over 470 different cooperatives uh, attend our events. Uh, the main events, um, including some of those were mentioned earlier, again, get over 95% uh, kind of satisfaction uh, kind of for those ways of bringing uh, members uh, together. Are there any co-ops in the room that have got less than 10 million Pounds of turnover. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, you may be among those co-ops that will benefit from one change that um, we've made to the audit requirements for fast growing uh, co-ops. Some years ago, we persuaded the government to get rid of the mid the, the requirement for a mid-year um, uh, audited statement, sorry about that, Nicola, for, in terms of the, uh, because it saved our members something like 200,000, not all on KPMG, 200,000 uh, kind of, you know, pounds in those audit fees. Uh, with this change is something that we campaigned for. We, get, we were allowed, we saw a doubling of the threshold um, uh, under which co-ops do not have to have the same audit requirements uh, as others. And that brings us into line with companies uh, kind of more uh, more widely. Through the Hive, supported by the uh, Cooperative Bank, and we're very grateful to the Cooperative Bank for its uh, active partnership and support uh, of the sector through the Hive programme, 
we've been able to support over 350 uh, fledgling co-ops and growing co-ops with different forms of business support uh, or, or advice. The community shares story of, of which Leeds Community Homes is one example, but, but one, of, uh, one of many. Uh, John is now an expert on the Glen Wyvis Distillery, which is uh, a, community, a cooperative distillery in the north of Scotland. Uh, that I think it closed about over 250 years ago. It's one of Rabbi Burns' favourite uh, whiskies. Uh, it's been reopened by the community in, in Dingwall as a, as a project to regenerate a town that actually had been left to go a bit more to rack and ruin, a, a, you know, ring road around it had been left there revitalizing the town. The distillery is now being set up as a tourist center. So you can go there, uh, you can get on an electric bus and go and visit the distillery. Now, the only thing is that whiskey takes longer to brew, if that's the right word, sorry, uh, distill, <laughs> than a community share issue does to raise. So they started off with gin as their first Product. We've helped our members raise over two million pounds in share equity uh, in 2017. We did, as Jane said, um, launch the Storm and Floods Appeal. You know, at the time of Brexit, we believe passionately that we need to be more international and more open than ever. And we're grateful to uh, a late Friday afternoon email that we got from colleagues at Southern Cooperative that said, with all the news about typhoons and, and hurricanes, is there going to be any kind of appeal? Because if there was, we would, we would donate. That started a weekend's work uh, with the team here and in contact with a number of our, uh, of our members. And by Monday morning, we launched an appeal that went out with a £50,000 starting donation from the uh, cooperative group with Southern Co-op, uh, amongst others, in, in contributing to it. And a number of, a large number of societies contributed to raising around 140,000. I've seen the photos from some of the early results in Nepal, for example, where they're affected uh, by flooding. And it's a very, very encouraging response uh, that, is, uh, that is there. So thank you. But also as a member, don't hesitate to suggest. We won't always work over the weekend, but when it's an emergency, uh, we will. Our communications work has been uh, excellent. And um, I pay tribute to staff colleagues our outgoing colleague, um, Giles Simon, who left to go and work as a member at, uh, at SUMA. Thanks, Ross, for poaching him, but many others as well. We've got some fabulous resources that are out there. One video uh, was viewed over 200,000 times. Uh, another one with Michael Sheen, uh, the actor, a little moment of celebrity, uh, Magic Dust at Cooperative Congress uh, last year was viewed 180 uh, thousand times and of course cooperatives fortnight which is coming up uh, in uh, later in june before cooperative congress on june the 23rd is our time to celebrate the cooperative difference what difference we make how we are different what difference we make to the um, to, to the country and the final one is 36 million and i don't know if any of you can guess what this might be you might have been involved i don't know we helped to run a buy twitter campaign that we said, well, actually, why couldn't Twitter be owned by its users? And working with activists in the States and elsewhere, we put a resolution down at the annual general meeting of Twitter in San Francisco. Uh, the board didn't decide to send me, which is a disappointment. But uh, the board of Twitter tried to rule it out. They took it to the Securities Exchange Commission, tried to get rule out, but we, the res resolution was put down correctly. It went to a vote. We got 36 million votes from Twitter shareholders in favor of a resolution to explore a cooperative model. Unfortunately, uh, money talks and the, the big shareholders had rejected. So it, was, it didn't go through. But it was a campaign to show that, very much as your presentation showed in the work of Kotec, that cooperatives are about the future. We are so relevant to these times. This is a great age of participation, a great age of of, of cooperation. And many of those technology options do not have to be enclosed by venture capital and by Silicon Valley. They can be democratically uh, owned in a very true spirit of, of cooperation. Uh, and then finally, and I should uh, uh, close on this. Um, I was given eight minutes. I think I'm eight and a half. Um, the uh, International Labour Organization talked about the work of our data, our open data. 
And um, some years ago, we, it, it was a, a subject that would come up at our annual general meetings. Why is the data that Co-ops UK puts out so poor? There's a co-op here that died five years ago. There's a new co-op there that nobody uh, kind of knows. Can we really trust the, the figures? And we took that seriously. We took seriously what you were saying, our, our members worked with others, regional councils, Jenny, and, uh, and others, the Cooperative Development Scotland, uh, Wales Cooperative Centre, uh, with whom we partner. And uh, the team led by kind of Paul and colleagues uh, at the back were praised by the International Labour Organization looking at cooperative st statistics last year as the gold standard uh, for data on co-ops. And that's our role, is not to be data experts, but is to tell the cooperative story. And in telling that story, the inspiring story of our members, uh, the story of our members that we are proud to be able to work with uh, and to support, what we're able to do is to build a cooperative economy and to do so by promoting and developing and hopefully uniting as well the cooperative sector. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ed. Uh, time for questions. We've got a first question from online. So, Zena. Yeah. Um, so, Martin Meteart, who is uh, attending from Cooperative Business Consultants, has asked, um, power to change is obviously fantastic news for co-ops in England. Is, the co is Cooperative UK lobbying for similar opportunities in Scotland, Wales, and Northern <laughs> Ireland? Yeah, yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, what we've been able to try uh, in England, power to change are limited in terms of their focus on England, um, is, is novel. Uh, no one else has done this, this idea of essentially almost institutional investment into cooperative societies, but on the same terms as members that are putting up uh, their own capital uh, for that. And it is, and Michael described it as a pilot, and rightly so, and uh, actually, we've got plenty of things wrong, uh, plenty of learning. It's taken some time. Neil Turton, my colleague, has uh, been involved in, in much of this you know, directly. So we're learning as we go. But we are proving the model. Um, so Martin, um, you know, congratulations on your work in Scotland with many community cooperatives uh, that I know and I'm aware of. And we will be really hopeful that with the support of uh, our members in Scotland and partners in Scotland, um, including the Development Trust Association Scotland, who run the Community Shares Unit there in partnership with us, that we could be able to bring this model uh, right throughout the UK. Thanks for that. Any questions to Ed from the floor, from the room? Don't let him out that easily. <laughs> Looks like you've got away with it again, Ed. Uh, any questions? No. Ah, thank you, Jenny. Um, Hello, Jen. Just, just. On the, um, do it yeah. um, we've obviously circulated that, and uh, I think it'd be quite interesting to get some feedback on how that is working out and who is taking it up. Is it community groups? Is it individuals? How is it, how is it working? I think it's really Thank you very much. And, um, you know, Jenny, your question is, as you know, relates to the National Cooperative Development Strategy uh, under the theme of, of Do It Ourselves, uh, which we've worked on and developed with our members uh, across, the, uh, across the sector. And it's been a really exciting process, but it also helps our work at Cooperatives UK because it gives us a framework within which we can focus on how to grow the cooperative economy. And many of the conversations that we have with our members are about what the fit is in relation uh, to that. Uh, in terms of example of some of the work that is, uh, that is going on, uh, one of the themes was around replicating success. Um, and one of the really you know, most in, you know, inspiring, I think, stories of the last uh, kind of year, it's in 2018 rather than 2017, and Mike, just to give credit to, um, to, to you, uh, for kind of work around this, uh, if I've got that right, is a student housing cooperative uh, kind of uh, secondary association. What's the title? Sorry. Student cooperative. Student cooperative Homes. Thank you very much. And, you know, this is a, a secondary cooperative, which is trying to spread a very successful model 
that has started in Edinburgh and in Birmingham and, uh, and elsewhere. So that's one example of, of, of work along those lines. We talked about three um, added, three new sectors where we thought the cooperative model would be particularly relevant. Uh, one in social care, the second in uh, digital uh, platform co-ops, and the third in uh, freelancer co-ops and, and you know, people working self-employed. And again, we're seeing examples across that. We've just been running over the last um, uh, week or so a, uh, an accelerator for platform co-ops. So essentially, if you think of uh, Uber, Airbnb, this is what you think of as platforms. Why should those platforms, or Twitter indeed, not be owned democratically by the people that, that drive for those or use those uh, services? That's the platform co-op idea. And with Stir to Action, our member, we've launched Unfound, which is an accelerator for platform co-ops. And we've got six fledgling would-be uh, platform co-ops, and they're so exciting, uh, really, to see. We've got um, one is social care, uh, which is a multi-stakeholder, <coughs> fair shares model. Uh, Emma presented at Co-op Congress, so you'll have seen that uh, kind of develop and, uh, and, and emerge. That's getting support from larger social care co-ops, like... Katrefi Cymru in, in Wales, for example, that is uh, offering to connect. Uh, we've got taxi drivers uh, kind of uh, in there. Uh, we've got uh, physiotherapists. There's a music streaming uh, platform co-op. So really the, the future coming forward through those kinds of ventures. And then again, in terms of the freelancer co-ops, we've been working. So one of the really positive things we've done over the last month, uh, in fact, is to um, announce a tie-up with uh, actually the UK's largest freelancer co-op uh, called um, Ipsy. Uh, and Ipsy has 67,000 uh, members, have worked through there and recognised um, their work as a, um, as, a, as a cooperative. So there's really exciting moves going forward. I would ask all of you in the room and or online also to take a look at the toolkit in the way that you said, Jenny, to see how your cooperative can engage in this because the strategy is not a strategy for a team of people in Manchester to do. That's never going to work. It's an open invitation to anybody to get involved in the cooperative sector. And it's a recognition of those valued and expert people that work in the cooperative development sector, often working against the odds and with limited resources to do it. How can your co-ops get involved? I would love, and I know, Jenny, that you're on the, count, the National Member Council of the Co-op Group. I would love to see the Co-op Group take a lead uh, and have a, a clear and compelling answer to how the Co-op is the leading consumer cooperative with engaging with the National Cooperative Development Strategy uh, as well. So I hope you can hear about what we've been doing in our members, but also take it back to your own spaces, democratic spaces, uh, board spaces, workplaces and think about how you can get engaged in this story because we're better together that's the core cooperative message and that's certainly true for cooperative development let's see who's got the uh, ah behind you sorry um tanya dean just asking about um cooperative development on the ground so uh, lots of discussion at the moment regarding doubling the cooperative economy whichever themes they sit under but um, some independent societies are funding some cooperative development on the ground, but it's a general concern throughout the movement and where do we go from that? And I know yourselves with Through the Hive are dealing with some of that, but I think cooperative development as a whole for all cooperatives in the room or subscribe to you is how we can work together to raise funds to have correct cooperative development on the ground. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya. And I, I mean, I agree wholeheartedly with your kind of comment and your suggestion that you know this is partly about resources, and I think partly also what we're doing is learning about the the way to fit this into a commercial proposition as well for cooperatives, so it does feed into a virtuous circle, so that it's not asking our members to be uh, philanthropists in terms of something else. Uh, they're doing something that is core to their identity as, as a cooperative, cooperating you know, with others. The supply chain example was a great example. Kotec is an amazing example of co-ops cooperating together and pulling, pulling themselves up by the bootstrap in, 
in doing so. If we can connect, um, you know, co-tech in a simple way with, you know, technology and procurement spend from co-ops across the sector, again, we're starting to see how this could really grow. It's one of the beauties of the movement, you know, compared to some others that, you know, we have the small and we have the large, but there's this idea of equality that we can really learn from, uh, from either, each other. And if we can find ways to trade with each other, that's good. The development advice then comes as an essential tool to be able to make that uh, happen. And I think we've got concerns, for example, around knowledge and succession, that there's a lot of expertise out there that is risk, at risk of, of, of being lost. Um, and so the, you know, the cooperative development strategy was intended to affirm the value of resources going in in exactly that way. David. David Stanbury, member of the uh, Co-op Group's National Members Council. Uh, I'm not an accountant, an accountant uh, so I should preface my remarks by saying that, but it looks as if the total assets are 1.3 million, of which almost half a million is invested in power to change. Uh, that seems quite a high proportion, and I do wonder just how secure those uh, investments of almost half a million are. I mean, Michael is, is, is here and can talk to this, but just to explain, the money is from power to change, not to power to change. It's new additional money that is granted by this lottery charitable foundation through Cooperatives UK, and the money is invested in fledgling co-ops. So it is money that is in line with the investment policy that um, we have as an organisation, um, but it is money that is at risk. I don't know, Nicola, whether you'd want to kind of, you know, say anything more about, you know, about the treatment. It's a relatively unusual thing that we are, you know, we are doing here. Um, it, it is quite unusual. Um, and we did look at the, Can we have a microphone? Sorry, it, it is quite unusual, and we did look at the accounting as a result. But effectively, you've been given those funds by Power to Change. You've invested them into separate investments. Um, and the um, return that you will get from those investments or the value of those investments should grow as the investments have been made in them, but will need to be reviewed for impairment going forward if any um, circumstances should change. So the carrying value of those investments will be reviewed at every balance sheet date, if that makes sense. One more question over here. And if we can have shorter answers. <laughs> sure, Students Corporation and others. Um, I was just wondering, so if we turn to page 38, investments. Um, so for value carried forward, we've got um, 400,000 invested in the co-op group, 576 in other cooperative shares, got power to change. I was just wondering what comes under other investments? Uh, 289,000 pounds, because I can't seem to see a breakdown. 38, so other investments that... Oh, uh, it's, we've got money invested through James Sharp in, um, on the Stock Exchange PLC. Equity investment. Ethical equity investments. Um, should you not think that would be better investing within the corporate movement rather than the stock exchange, especially those new corporate investors, like not only the corporate movement, but being a better financial position? We've, we've, we've spread our risk by putting in some in different places. It's not all in the corporate movement. There's some outside, and we get a good return for it, and it's something that the audit committee agreed to do. And it's something that we review through the audit committee every quarter, or, or three times a year. Three times a year. So it's a good question, but no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another question down the front. Jenny Ruff. Would it affect the power to change of the co-op bank if it had its cooperative name taken from it, as is proposed? What was the first part of the question? Sir? Would it affect the power to change of the co-op bank? Um, 
there's no link between the power to change I funding. Think I oh, sorry. Okay. So we are. Okay. Say again. <laughs> I suppose um, I, I understand that the co-op bank underpins to some extent this organisation and also the hive, or, or is a significant contributor. And I also hear that um, there's, a pro there's a proposal to take the, the name cooperative from it uh, because of its structure not being cooperative, even though it helps um, cooperatives. And so I was wondering whether that might be a dangerous move in terms of um, its credibility with respect to help uh, supporting the court movement. I can talk to yes, you. Yes, I mean, the issue that we know is an uncomfortable one, uh, which is essentially the demutualization of the cooperative bank um, in 2014 and 2015. Um, the, arrange the agreement that exists with the cooperative bank around the name, uh, given that the cooperative bank is now investor owned, so it is not a cooperative, it has cooperative values enshrined within its articles, which is very welcome. Um, it's never been uh, the, technically, it was always included in the statistics of the cooperative economy because although a company, it was wholly owned by uh, a member-owned cooperative, so that ultimately you could say that member control uh, was there, whereas now it is essentially investor-owned um, and controlled. For the moment, yes. And um, so the, the, there is criteria that we have used uh, in working with the cooperative bank around that identity. We have a compliance agreement and framework. Part of that is around the support that it does give to the cooperative uh, kind of sector. Uh, if the cooperative bank, for whatever reason, stopped that uh, support, then that would be a significant gap because the the national cooperative development strategy that is supported quite significantly by the Hive program. Um, I ha I have said to our a number of our larger members, you know, that if the cooperative bank was not funding the Hive, then we would be coming to you. I'm, I'm eyeballing some of our members in the room as I speak. Um, to do this because it's a it's a key piece of infrastructure for the um, uh, for the sector. So this is a it's it's absolutely on our risk register. We look at this very closely. The board consider it uh, quite uh, kind of regularly. We're in close contact with others such as uh, Save Our Bank, which is the you know the the union of uh, cooperative bank uh, you know customers, and we're very much on the same same page uh, kind of as them for the moment, which is to encourage. Uh, the cooperative bank to live up to those cooperative uh, values and to be clear about its uh, nature and identity. Thanks for that, Ed. Thanks for those questions. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's time now to uh, for me to formally move the uh, the resolution on the annual report and financial statements. Uh, can I get a second in the room for the annual accounts? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in that case, can we therefore have a vote on? Uh, accepting the financial report and statements. All those in favour, show. Thank you very much. Is anybody against? And any abstentions? Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, now we have to do. Online. Oh, sorry, I've got to wait a little bit for the online voters. Uh, thank you very, very much indeed. I can imagine the day someday when they'll all vote against. That would be quite strange. <laughs> wouldn't it? Have something going on outside that he wasn't really in control of. Um, so we move on to resolution number two, and these resolutions really are, I suppose, the classic housekeeping resolutions. The first one is from John Anderson. John, I'd like to just uh, uh, point out this is John's final uh, opportunity to address the room uh, as a member of the Board of Cooperatives UK. Uh, he's only been doing it for 38 years. So if he gets it wrong, it's because he's such a youngster and he hasn't done much practice. Uh, John Anderson, the floor is yours. A great pleasure in my last co-op duty of recommending the reappointment of KPMG as the Society's Auditors. We are fortunate to have Nicola Quayle, who is the Manchester Senior Partner, the first female to do so, to supervise the audit. After 21 years 
She always knows as much as I do about the co-op movement. <laughs> Recommend the reappointment of KPMG as auditors from the conclusion of this meeting until the conclusion of the next AGM next year. Can we have a second from the floor, please? Thank you very much. Uh, can we have a show of the first, we have a vote, uh, uh, all those in favour of that resolution? Thank you very much. Is there anybody against? No, thank you very much. Just uh, any abstentions? In favour of one abstention. So I think that's carried. Thank you very much. And again, the next tranche of resolutions are slightly tidied up resolutions. Technically, we don't have to do this, do this, but we thought, it, uh, as we recommend it to our members that they should do it, we thought we ought to do these things as well. So, resolution number three on board fees. Uh, this is to be moved by. Oh, sorry, Ross, I was looking past you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ross, Ross. I haven't got a speech prepared, sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's three um, that I will be present. So I'm Ross Hodgson, um, chair of the new chair of the Remuneration Appointments and Succession Committee, and also member of the board. Um, so we'll go with the first one. It's also the birth level three, but it's like three A, three B. So the first one's the board fee. Um, that the directors are eligible to claim. So in 2011, our members approved an annual increase to the board fee in line with RPI, and if this increase could be applied each year without further member consent. So following some consideration of best practice governance, the board proposed removing the right for the directors to automatically receive any increase. Instead, revert to the position where any uplift in board fee requires the agreement of a simple majority of members at the general meeting. Um, so, so do, so do you have a second for this proposal? Thank you very much. Uh, all those in favour, please shout. Anybody against? Thank you very much. That's good, Ross. You're doing well so far. Chairs, Chairs fee, which I'm not interested in. Fee, I'm not, oh, sorry, I'm going to vote it again. I'm, I'm never going to do the Eurovision Song Contest, am I? Uh, Thank you. Good. Resolution number three. Chairs fee. So I have no interest in whatsoever. So Nick will be quiet through this. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this concerns the fee paid to the chair of Corrupts UK, currently Nick. Um, our chair is elected to the board each year and the chair receives this currently separate annual fee, currently, which is 2700 and is not eligible for the board fee um, on top of that. Uh, Remco has completed a piece of work to review whether the amount paid is fair and provides adequate compensation um, and is now proposing that it increases. The board members feel that over a number of years we've begun to rely on the goodwill of the chair. The role has broadened over time and it's beyond the facilitation of the board meetings and it's an often now acting as an ambassador for Coach UK, attending and speaking at events, working alongside the staff team, doing board reviews. Um, so it's massively expanded and uh, as a new member to the board, I can attest to the amount of time and effort that Nick does put into the role. Um, so the review completed um, considered chairs fees in cons comparable organisations, the time commitment expected, and the average wage at Copes UK. The proposal today is for a, a significant increase in the fee paid to the chair, which if approved will ensure that from now on any director wishing to stand for election receives a fair award for the time uh, that they put in. Um, there's also another dimension that is sort of important given the amount of time that Nick does put in, that the role isn't just obtainable for people that can afford to give up that time and that people are rewarded and paid for the time they give up. I can attest to the fact that Nick does put these hours in um, and does well, probably puts more hours than this in, but we'll leave it at this for now. Um, so yeah, I'll move that we um, move to the vote, if I'm allowed to do that. Uh, is it, before we, do yeah, uh, does anybody have any questions? John. Um, yeah, John Boyle from Revolver Co-op. Um, is this resolution being based on the incredible work that Matthews does, or is this resolution being based on the expected uh, work of any chair? I know it says that uh, on there, but... Um, You've alluded a lot to the fantastic work yeah. that Nick does. 
Um, I'd rather the motion actually was restricted to the work expected of any future chair and existing chair. Um, I think there is, yeah. you know. So it, apologies if I've alluded to Nick too much in that. Um, could downplay you in the future. But yeah, it is about what is expected of the chair. And Nick is putting in what we expect of the chair. And that amount that he is putting in is over and above really what that the fee currently gets. Um, so that's why it's a bit mixed up. Thanks for that question, John. <laughs> um, you can get your own back on. We need a seconder. Look, it wasn't my wife then seconding it, wasn't it? Um, all else in favour, please show. Thank you. Anybody against? Any abstentions? And online? Incredible, I bet that. Unanimous. Obviously, we're winking too low. We should have gone in higher. Um, and last but not least, Ross, this, last is, but not this least. is slightly complicated, but I think you'll explain it to you. Thanks. <laughs> so, yeah, resident for So, this sticks up there the wording of the existing attendance allowance policy, which under Rule 46 requires the approval of members. That's why we're here. The substance of this small amendment is to enable anyone, including but not limited to current directors, to claim the allowance where they have incurred actual loss of earnings as a result of attending meetings or events at the request of Coach UK. The director may not claim for any time spent performing duties ordinarily expected to fall within that role, such as board meetings. To be completely open and honest, um, part of the reason that this has come about is that over the past few years, um, the old wording or the current wording, if you like, um, does not allow for directors to claim this fee, there's been about five or six times when they've been paid that fee, they shouldn't have been, this loss of earnings allowance, which is a, is a small amount, but that's partly why this review has come around, and partly what I alluded to last time of the importance of people being able to take roles and not expected to do things unpaid when they could be claiming earnings elsewhere. Um, so yeah, that, that's part of it, it's sort of a, it's a small change um, to allow directors outside of board meetings to be able to claim that fee, um, but hopefully I've explained that well enough. Yeah, I think that's, that, anybody got any questions to ask on this one? Jenny? Just wait for a microphone, sorry Jenny. Just so they can hear online. I think this is just a wording exercise, isn't it? Because yeah, as far as, since my board days on Corpse UK, we were actually following that pattern, weren't we? So, isn't this just a rewording it's of a, the existing change. position? It's a minor change in that the current uh, policy wouldn't allow a director who received a board fee to claim attendance allowance under any circumstances, even if they were attending, for example, the Worker Corp Council or an international event on our behalf. So, currently, it, it restricts directors from claim if they're receiving a board fee from also claiming it. So it is a small wording change. And I think I think also we'd like to be able occasionally, if we've got a colleague who serves on a, on a committee, from not, not from Corps UK, but say on the governance committee or an external committee where we, we ask people to do something on our behalf, uh, it's, I mean, I don't, think, I don't think very many people would give up uh, a day's pay for £90 uh, and travel all the way to Manchester. But at least it's a token to say that we, we appreciate the sacrifice they're making if they're doing something on behalf of the movement uh, that we've asked them to do, and they're not going to be uh, completely out of it. So it, it is a tidying up thing. Uh, but we've, we thought it was important as we as we demand other societies, uh, I mean, put these remuneration things to their members, that, that we, uh, whilst these are very trivial events relatively, that we, did, we go through the same process. Uh, thank you, Ross. Is there a second for this uh, motion? Thank you very much. Uh, all those in favour, please share. Thank you very much. Is there anybody against? Any abstentions? I'm voting online. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ross. Right. Thanks very much. So, uh, I, I, know, I know most of you only come for that middle bit uh, because you want to stand by me afterwards and get a drink. Um, but now we're going to some of perhaps more exciting uh, parts of the agenda. Uh, we move on to resolution uh, number five, and this is about uh, the future of the, the wonderful building in which we live. 
uh, Neil. Thanks, everyone. Uh, lovely, to, lovely to see everyone. Um, I only have um, a couple of minutes to speak, and you saw the film at the start of the meeting. And as you saw from the film, we're in a historic room in a very historic building, uh, the beautifully sunlit, actually, uh, bust in the corner of uh, George Jacob Holyoke, a great cooperator. And our building, Holyoke House, named after him, is a major part of movement history. Uh, recent years have seen many changes in Manchester in cooperative property. Um, the great Victorian buildings around us are all being restored, as you can see, if you walk around the area. But they're no longer owned by the movement, and they're no longer owned by cooperators. This building is. Holyoke House is the remaining movement building in Manchester. And as part of the National Curb Development Strategy, Curbs UK were asked to develop a 25-year strategy for Holyoke House. It is our home, of course, to Curbs UK, but it's also home to the Cooperative College, Coop Press, parts of the Phone Co-op, Cooperative Heritage Trust, I must thank for the excellent film you saw at the start, Abco, and various other third-party tenants. Uh, the building is old. Sometimes it needs a fair bit of TLC and repair. And over the last year, we've looked at various options for making Hollyoke a vibrant modern movement asset for this century, as well as the last. We've been developing what I think are some good ideas to increase the capacity of the building and rental income and help Copes UK achieve a more diverse source of income in future, which Michael referred to. We're presently talking to the cooperative group to achieve a clear legal title on which we may bring these ideas to fruition. Though Holyoke is to all extents and purposes the home of Copes UK and we have all revenue and liabilities as our responsibility, the legal title is complex for historic reasons you saw on the video the various reconfigurations of the building over the years and helped by the Luftwaffe. Coop Group have been helpful in early talks and we hope that Hollyoak development might take place alongside our 150th anniversary in 2020. The resolution in front of the AGM is not for any specific development proposal. That is yet to be decided. It is more a statement of principle that members are asked to agree the Hollyoke continues to serve as an asset for the movement and our time and resources over the next period, the next year, are used to develop specific ideas and plans to be brought in time for any development in the form of that development to the board and as required the members of Cooperatives UK. So the resolution that you see behind me reads that the Holyoke House was raised by subscription across the current movement as a home for the Cooperative Union in memory of George Jacob Holyoke, the great 19th century champion of the pioneers. It remains true to that purpose today. Members resolve to sustain the building as an asset for the movement, welcoming steps to secure the commercial viability and heritage quality of Holyoke House for the decades ahead. Thank you. So, Neil's moved the resolution. Are there any questions on this proposal? No. In that case, can we have a seconder? Oh, we've got a whole sea of seconders. <laughs> that means they either want to get on with it or they, <laughs> or they want to get on with it. Um, in that case, all those in favour of the resolution? Thank you very much. Is there anybody against? Any abstentions? Uh, and online? All votes in favour. All votes in favour. All votes in favour. Thank you very much. We just got one uh, piece of uh, information to convey before we close the meeting uh, and let everybody out for a sunny evening in Manchester. And that's worth a photograph in itself. Um, Tina, the elections to our board. We had uh, five board seats that uh, terms of office came to an end uh, this time. Um, and three of those saw uncontested nominations. And we will see Phil Hartwell nominated by HF Holidays uh, in the consumer-owned cooperatives category coming onto the board. 
and uh, Nick Matthews retained his seat nominated by Heart of England Society. We'll see uh, Eddie Thorne um, nominated by Scott Mid Cooperative representing retail consumer co-ops in Scotland and the North and I think Eddie's here today. There he is. So new director joining the board. Yeah, welcome. I think Phil might be here as well actually. Yeah. Phil Hartwell's just behind you as well. Sorry Phil. Yeah, young, um, young up and coming newcomer Phil. <laughs> And then we had two contested elections. Um, the first was for the seat for retail consumer cooperatives in the South. Um, and that contested election was won by Emma Howard from East of England yeah. Cooperative Society. Welcome, Emma. Emma. And uh, the second contested election was for the Federal's uh, membership category. Um, and the winner of that election was Robin Feast. Uh, who was nominated by the Building Societies Association. And I imagine Robin is waving furiously now because he's one of our online attendees today. So welcome, Robin. So we see uh, two directors standing down at this AGM. The first is Mark Leonette, who was uh, previously the federals, uh, sitting in a federal seat on our board. Um, Mark's also leaving his position, as most of you will know, at the Association of British Credit Unions. Um, and unfortunately isn't with us this evening as he's literally on his leaving due today is his last his death last day so we thought we wouldn't make him sit here when he could be out in the sun in the pub somewhere um, and then the other director that's retiring at this meeting as uh, Nick spoke about earlier is John Anderson and I think Nick wants to say a couple of words yes. about that uh, I, could, I don't know to start with John really uh, John, John, John's been on the board as, in most of my adult life uh, when, when I joined the board, I sat by John and uh, a couple of other old wags uh, from the movement. And I think that first year when I was just listening to them talking and explaining things to me, I probably learned more sitting next to John uh, in, in, in about 10 minutes than I did from all the induction and all the other stuff that everybody gave me. But John, John um, uh, is very strong and firm in his, his contribution and his beliefs. He's absolutely true to the cooperative principles and the co-op ideal. He's a man of deep integrity and honesty. And if John tells you something, you know that he's telling you what he believes to be the truth. And I, I absolutely, as chair of a board and as a member of a board, having people around the table with that degree of integrity and honesty is an incredible, valuable thing to have. And even when we don't agree about something, uh, which is often, <laughs> uh, we still we still get along uh, and work together and, and when we when we reach an agreement uh, he holds to the agreement and uh, I've learned an a tremendous amount from John uh, John's one of the, is, a, is an absolute one of my absolute all-time uh, you know mentors in the movement and I, I thank John both personally uh, as a member of the board of Cops UK and also on behalf of the board of his contribution to the, to, the, to the movement and to the society over that 38 years. And it's very all together, I think it's over 50 years, uh, 52 years, man and boy, uh, either working for, uh, studying about, or, 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 or serving as a board member uh, of cooperatives. Uh, I think that's an example uh, all of us can hope to and aim for. So John, thank you very, very much for your contribution. <laughs> At our earlier meeting, you'll be pleased to know it wasn't just applause we gave him, but we did give him uh, some shares in the Glen Vice Distillery. And I hope the dividend's going to be paid uh, in liquid uh, if you're going to get the, uh, the golden chair from that, uh, from that society uh, in the future. And I hope you have more time for the Hearts Football Club uh, and, for, and to improve your, your golf handicap. Uh, now you're not going to come 625 mile round trip uh, to Manchester from Northern Scotland. Uh, just finally, before we wrap up, I just want to say a couple of quite sincere thank yous. Uh, personally, I had a bit of a difficult year this year, uh, in the overall calendar year, and the support and solidarity of colleagues in the movement has been absolutely solid, and I thank every single one of you uh, for the contributions you gave to me personally, and to staff and to colleagues on the board at Cooperatives UK. But also, I'd like to thank our staff. Uh, we're, you know, we, we make a big show. We wave a big flag, 
But when you look behind the scenes, it's a bit like uh, that wonderful film, you know, Wizard of Oz. We make a lot of noise, we've got a great show on. But when you go behind the tent, there are 30 people working like beavers to deliver those outputs with a mere three million quid turnover. So what we get in terms of banks for our books as members of this society, I think is absolutely amazing. And I think we should thank all of our staff, the people who work on our behalf, to deliver those outputs for, the, for what they deliver. I'd also like, obviously, to thank uh, my colleagues on the board for their wisdom, insight, intelligence, uh, and that's just Vivian. Uh, and, <laughs> and also to the, uh, sorry, Vivian. And also to everybody else on the board for their contributions to the success of the society over the last 12 months. I'd like to thank Ed as uh, Chief Executive, uh, Neil of his tremendous contribution during the course of the year, and Zena, who is a new secretary, has been an absolute brick for me as, uh, you know, nudging and banging and telling me where I'm getting off pissed and uh, ISTE, uh, <laughs> uh, when I should be uh, uh, sticking to the script. So I'd like to thank everybody for taking part in tonight's annual general meeting. And I hope very much that I'll see all of you uh, on the 23rd of June at the COP Congress in London. And we don't go to London very often. And that's why we split the AGM from, the, from our trip to the smoke, or it is smoke again, unfortunately, into, the, into London. Uh, and I hope you'll all be there. And it'll be a fantastic event. Uh, but before you all go, I just wanted to jazz up uh, to get you all, uh, particularly our online listeners and members, uh, the opening, the ballot is now open for the cooperatives of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, we've already had, in a very short amount of time, over 11,000 votes in those, uh, uh, for those uh, cooperatives. We've got another few weeks to run. Uh, Dom, who's our uh, IT guy who monitors these things, uh, says he reckons at the current rate of travel, we should get over 40,000 votes, which he hopes, and I suppose we all do, will be more votes than Theresa May got in her constituency of Maidenhead uh, when she was elected to Parliament. If we can't beat that, I think we ought to be uh, taken outside and doing something too. So vote early, vote often, and get everybody else you know to vote in the cooperative uh, uh, elections. Thanks to everybody for their participation tonight. I think there might be a half a glass of Prosecco left before you all go. And thank you very much for your attendance. Mm.